Hello everyone, this is the Lama Life Livestream event of Lama Sultrim Alione. I'm Dreame and it's such a pleasure to connect with you this Sunday. For today's event, Lama Sultrim will speak about the memoir she is currently writing and the research she has been doing around her family. Through this research, Lama has been tracking the origins of Buddhism in America, leading back to Thoreau and Emerson. Lama will discuss these threads of early Buddhism in America and the connection to her family during our intimate gathering happening right here and right now. As I'm welcoming you, Lama is already seeing the chat, so please don't wait to send a warm hello to her, along with sharing from where you are connecting with us today. At the end of our session, uh, you will have an opportunity to offer Dana to Lama Sultrin, and I will talk more about it towards the end of this event. Let me now bring to your attention upcoming programs where you can receive teachings from Lama Sultrin live, virtually and in person. A virtual retreat coming up June 30th covers foundational practices called Dakini Nyondro, known as the Excellent Path of Great Bliss being the beginning of the cycle for accomplishing the Dakini Yeshet Sogyal from the also named in this, in this practice, we also encounter Samantha Badri, Prajnaparamita, Troma Nagmo, Machik Ladron, and Tara. This is not an ordinary nondro. This revelation on Yeshet Sogyal contains the secrets of the great mother Prajnaparamita. If you feel the call, it's not too late to join this five-day retreat with Lama Sultrim Alione and Tulku Osel Dorje. The second program I want to tell you about uh, will be held at the Tara Mandala Retreat Center in Colorado. Those of you uh, who have been there say it's an absolutely beautiful and magical place. And that's where Lama Sultrim will be coming to join the gathering of the Magyu program members. And that's awesome news. So between August 5th and 10th, this special retreat will be offered to provide a long-awaited opportunity to connect in person with our cherished Sangha and to dive deeply into the teachings of Magic Lapton. You are invited. I'll post uh, links to those offerings uh, in a moment. And with that being said, I want to invite... Lama Sultrim Alione, and we're looking forward to the stories that you, Lamala, will share with us today. And thank you, thank you always for these joyful chance, chance, chances <laughs> to meet and share. It's so precious. Thank you, Lamala. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, this is a an important day for, for many reasons, including the uh, Juneteenth celebration and also Father's Day. Um, and we're coming up on solstice on Tuesday. I've been really enjoying these long, long days. I go to the beach and stay until 8, 8.30 and watch the sunset. There's such a feeling of, of spaciousness when this time of year comes around. And then all of a sudden it's over and then they start getting shorter and shorter so enjoy these times and um, i wanted to also just speak a little bit more about that retreat that i'm teaching with my son dakini retreat because it's going to be a, a the kind of thing where it will be the beginning of a group of a cohort that will then go on for several years. And if you don't get on the boat, then you miss the boat. And so 
this is quite an extraordinary lineage. Osul Nintik means the heart essence of luminosity. Osel is luminosity and Ning is heart and Tik is essence or sphere or Bindu. And so this is actually a Terma cycle that was originally revealed at Tara Mandala and this particularly particular Nundro, which we are teaching came from a request that I made to our teacher in Tibet, uh, Pelo Rinpoche, and he downloaded it from the Dharmakaya. I requested a female-centered Nundro because I said, Rinpoche, my students, many of them have spent many, many years liberating themselves from male dominance and to do a practice where the whole focus is on male enlightened beings isn't going to work for them. And he had already received this nundra, but me saying that triggered him to fully reveal it. And it is a nundra, which many of you know what that is. It's preliminary practices, but in this case, they're not counted as they usually are. Usually there's accumulations of 500,000 of these. So uh, it's not based on counting, it's based on experience. And the language and the teachings in it are really Dzogchen, sort of, I guess you could say, masked in visualization and other kinds of practices, but really it's nature of mind. <laughs> So I'm, I'm enjoying seeing everyone coming in saying good morning and hello from all over the world. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually uh, really excited about this. We've taught it a couple of other times. And when Rinpoche delivered it, he said, this is so fresh, it's still warm from the warm breath of the Dakinis on it. And it feels like that. It's incredibly powerful. So I just wanted to say something about that so you don't miss it if it's something that you think that you might be interested in. So, yeah, and uh, Father's Day, I'd like to lead a little Father's Day meditation in a minute, but I would like to first read the prayer requests this is something that you can do, add someone or yourself to the prayer requests. And my request of you as I read these requests is to attune to these people as well as you can and send them a blast of love and healing energy. I believe this really has an impact. And so let's try to do that together. And before we begin that, let's raise bodhicitta the intention to be together for the benefit of all beings. A heartfelt longing for the happiness of others. A joy in their joy. Compassion in their suffering. And the intention to be together today and to practice Buddhism for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Thank you. So these are the prayer requests. And as I say these names, I'll also say the location and you can send out your prayers to them. Janice Gump, Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Darren and Nikki Baltz, Tara Squid. Arkansas.
Juanita Macaron Corrales, New Mexico. Laden and her family in Canada. Anne Prevelsky, Austin, Texas. Esteban Yepes in Medellin, Colombia. Sandy Benevento, Manteca, California. Victims in the village of Bodanivka, Ukraine. And to everyone in Ukraine, Russian invasion of Ukraine is now in its 115th day. So let's send a big blast to Ukraine and all of those affected by what's happening in Ukraine. We've been doing the 13th Tara mantra for Ukraine, the Tara that stops wars. And I saw on my Facebook page that we have reached almost 4 million mantras. So thank you for sending in your mantras. You can find that link. Maybe you can post that, Dreame. Uh, if you'd like to participate, you can start now and you visualize yourself as that 13th Tara who stops wars, that's her activity. And you become her, do the mantra and send that energy to Ukraine. I do believe that these things have an impact. Sometimes the karma is such that we can't stop it, but it still is having an impact. It's a power for the good, for peace. So that is the prayer requests. And then I'd like to do a little meditation on fathers. Yeah, fathers. My father, I'll just mention briefly, was a newspaper man, journalist, publisher of a small town newspaper in New Hampshire, very ethical person, 500 people came to his funeral and so many people told me stories I had no idea about of how my father had helped them in various ways, helped them get started in doing something they wanted to do or help them make a connection. So just want to honor my father. His name was James Dennis Ewing. And let's close our eyes and connect with that father energy we have within ourselves. Sometimes we need to be our own father. Maybe we didn't have a good experience with our father. Often men have been cut off from their feelings the expression of their feelings and are also under a lot of pressure. And sometimes it's hard for them to express love, to be close and to express their feelings. So sometimes we have to father ourselves. So let's first begin with that father within us. the father's role as protector, as someone who protects the mother and her young. That's the role often in the animal world. 
of the father figure helps to provide food and safety. So feel that father energy within you, protecting you, caring for you. Fathers are nurturing also, and many fathers are taking the main nurturing role now in families. And then feel the outer father, your, your actual father, or those who have acted in a fatherly way to you. And let's send them some gratitude and appreciation. And also your grandfathers. Sometimes we don't actually know our own father. We're adop adopted or something has happened, but they're still out there. And if we have an adopted father, they took this role. So sending to them, to our lineage of fathers. If our father was not a great father or was actually harmful, abusive, let's take a moment to acknowledge that underneath all of that, there is Buddha nature, there's probably trauma and other reasons why they acted the way they did. Doesn't mean it's okay, but we can hold them in that bigger picture of the matrix of human experience. And then stretching out our awareness to our immediate community Maybe it's your family community, your neighborhood. I live on a street now in Encinitas. It's a cul-de-sac. And there's a lot of wonderful fathers here right around me with young children and some with older children. So think about the fathers around you. and then stretch out to the whole area around you, the larger area, whether you're in a city or in the country, of feeling gratitude to that father energy. Such an important role. And all those who may not be literally fathers, but are mentoring others, taking that role. And then out to all the fathers and grandfathers and their fathers in the whole country I'm in the United States now, so I'm sending it out to that, the whole country. And then out from there to the world. And let's send some special love to those fathers who left their families and are fighting in the Ukraine war had to say goodbye to their wife and their children and just 
out of the blue, had to go to war with no training often, no experience. Imagine their loneliness and perhaps fear, but also their courage, strength. And to all the fathers around the world who are at risk in one way or another, in order to protect their community. Feel that energy all around the world, the positive masculine. However that enacts, whether it's in a more conventional, traditional way or in an alternative, newer way. Feel that and let's send gratitude to, to all of those human fathers and also all the animal fathers and the, the bird fathers and all beings, all those beings who often take a real role within their family. And let's make a prayer for the healing of the masculine, the wounded masculine, to become the sacred masculine that in the Tibetan tradition represents skillful means and compassion, the expression of the ground of being, emptiness of the great mother as the masculine skillful means and compassion. healing of that into its wisdom aspect. And then as you open your eyes and we come back together, feeling that positive father within you, the masculine skillful means and wisdom masculine and the feminine in balance within us. Yeah, if any of you want to write in the names of your fathers into the chat, or those who have acted as fathers for you, and their location, whether they're alive or have passed away, that might be a nice thing to just see those names of the fathers. Yeah, this beautiful, a beautiful feeling I had doing that, of that energy. It's rare to just focus on that in particular. And also remember that the summer solstice that's coming up is a good day to do the prayer of Samantabhadra, an amazing Dzogchen prayer. Perhaps we will arrange something on that day to read that together online and do that meditation on the ground of being. Oh, I'm, I'm seeing the, the names coming in. Yeah. Some people lost their father fairly recently. Yeah, you can write the last name too if you want. Um, yeah, a lot of people who have passed away you know, I had, I had this feeling when my father was alive, like nothing bad could really happen to me, which of course is really naive, but it actually, I had that feeling when he passed away, like, oh, I don't have that anymore. I don't have that feeling that my dad's here, so nothing bad's going to happen to me. So I, I'm sure that others have, have had that feeling um, yeah, here somebody that says their uncle's more like a father. Um, yeah, some people have a lot of wounds around the father. Um, 
Wow, somebody's father was left blind and handicapped after an accident at the age of 33. This is really beautiful seeing these come in. Yeah. So as those continue to come in, I'll start talking about what I wanted to talk about today. Um, so I'm writing a memoir and the name of that memoir is Places She Lives. And it was a book that I actually wrote, a complete book and turned it in, sold it to Viking in 1992 when I was just, I think 45 years old, something like that. Uh, and it was a big book already, a lot had happened. And then the following year, we found the land that became Taramandala. And so I, I gave back that advance and I took back the manuscript and it just sat there while I created with lots of help from many people, including my beloved husband, David, who was such an amazing father figure there and really helped to give birth to and protect that place for the next years. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> it's great you have that picture. Thank you. Um, so um, I didn't do anything with, with that manuscript and then recently pulled it out and started to look at it again. And I hadn't written much about the beginning of my life, a little bit and a little bit touching on my grandparents. So recently I wrote a chapter, particularly about my maternal grandparents that then triggered research into the whole history of Buddhism in America, particularly in New England and Boston, which is where they came from. So my genetic heritage is basically Boston. <laughs> uh, some New York, some up as far north as Nova Scotia, but really I had five ancestors on the Mayflower on my mother's side. Mayflower, if anybody doesn't know, was that first boat that came over to Plymouth, the Puritans on it. Five ancestors on that. And when I did my ancestry.com, DNA test. It was so boring. Uh, it was just Boston, England, Ireland, Scotland, a little bit of Swedish, some French, but that was it. And just this line that went between England, basically, and Boston area, New England. And so I had hoped for something a little more exotic, a little more interesting that would be in there. There was something like 1% Japanese American, uh, something like that, but uh, mostly it was, that's what it was. And so I grew up in that world in New England. My, both my maternal grandparents were PhDs from Harvard Radcliffe in, in philosophy. They were both philosophy students. And then my grandfather taught at Harvard philosophy. And my grandmother was a fifth woman to get her PhD from what was then Radcliffe, which has now been incorporated into Harvard. Uh, Harvard would not allow women. And so they formed a college sort of begrudgingly and then the professors had to give the exact same lecture that they gave to the men to the women because they didn't believe that women and men could be in the same class together. And the president of Harvard at the time, whose name was William Elliott, the time of my grandmother said the only reason for a woman to get a higher education was if it would make the home more beautiful the only reason. And he was very against women uh, getting educated, higher education. So, so 
my grandmother, her story was that her father, who uh, was a businessman, sort of middle-class businessman from Roxbury, which was a suburb of Boston, still is, uh, he had lost his father to a heart condition in uh, at, at, at a young age, he was 16 years old and he was pulled out of high school. He wanted to become a lawyer, he was pulled out and he had to start working to support his family. And that's what he did the whole rest of his life. He gradually moved up in, in the company that he had started in and at the age of 16, but really never accomplished what he wanted to accomplish because he didn't finish his education. And so he encouraged my grandmother, who was the oldest of four, she wanted to go to college and he encouraged her, but asked that she go to a college that was close enough to home that she could come back on weekends. And so she ended up going to Wellesley College, which is a suburb of Boston, a wonderful women's college that had been formed a, a short time before uh, her when she went there. And uh, she was born in 1876. And so she went to Wellesley. And then while she was at Wellesley, her father died. And then her brother contracted typhoid fever and almost died. And her mother had a heart condition also. So one thing I discovered in this research is there's a lot of heart conditions in my genetic history. So, so she left Wellesley in her sophomore year. And usually when that happened, women didn't end up going back. They would get married or something would happen and they would never finish. But she really wanted to go back. And I think in a way carrying the torch for her father, she did return. She finished her BA and then followed that with a master's at Wellesley in philosophy. And then she began to be invited to attend lectures at Harvard, Harvard Radcliffe, and was invited into the graduate program there and moved in with a professor's family in Cambridge and began to do graduate studies at, at Radcliffe. And so she studied philosophy and apparently she was very good and her professors were really impressed by her. Royce, Josiah Royce was her main professor for her thesis and he raved about her, her thesis. And so what's interesting here is that Royce studied Buddhism. Her main professor studied Buddhism. So this goes back to the fact that it was this grandmother who gave me my first book of Buddhism when I was only 15 years old. And it was just one year before she passed away because she got her education and became a professor and married late considered to be very late, the age of 34, and then had three girls and my mother was the youngest. My grandmother was always kind of old. <laughs> I was like, you know, experienced her as being old. And, and she was fairly old by the time we came along because my mother also got a graduate degree and then married and had children. So um, my grandmother, was at Harvard with Royce and Royce was interested enough in Buddhism to learn Sanskrit and read it in the original. She was also at Harvard with William James, who many of you may have read, very popular book in many colleges called The Varieties of Religious Experience. And um, so James was there. He also was interested in Buddhism. And also another one of her professors whose name was William Palmer, 
he was also interested in Buddhism. So I didn't know this until this recent research that she was exposed to Buddhist thinking through her philosophy professors at Harvard. The other interesting thing that I discovered is she was friends with Cahil Gilbran, who was the author of The Prophet, and he actually drew a portrait of her, which we have. In, I believe it was 1908, she got her PhD in 1906, so it would have been after that. So she was traveling in those circles in Boston of people who were interested in quantum physics, in abstract mathematics, which she later taught. She, she left teaching when she started having children. She married in 1910. My mother was born in 1915. So in that first five years, she had three daughters and stopped teaching, even though when they got married, there was talk that, oh, she'll continue, she'll keep teaching, uh, which her professors really wanted her to do, but she ended up not doing that. And so she studied Buddhism in, in some form. I don't know to what extent she was interested in it, but enough to give me a book, a Buddhism, which was called Zen Telegrams. It was little brushstroke paintings and kind of haikus by somebody named Paul Reps. She gave that to me when I was 15, and it was the year before she, was she passed away. The way she passed away was she had a headache, and she drove herself to the doctor's office, always independent woman, drove herself there and she passed out in the doctor's office from a stroke and never regained consciousness. It was 1963. So she lived from 1876 to 1963. She met my grandfather in the context of studying philosophy and particularly in these meetings that would happen in the home of William James and also in the home of Josiah Royce, her professor of a kind of philosophical group. And my grandfather went to those meetings and she was there too. And she was the only woman in all these meetings. She was the only woman in the philosophy department. And so when I did my family lineage demons and family lineage ally map <coughs> to do with the feeding your demons and couple of training, I realized that my grandmother had had this demon of patriarchy that she had had to deal with in her education, not being able to get a book out of the library by herself. She had to have a male student go into the Harvard library, which was of course much better equipped than the Radcliffe library to get books. And so my grandmother met my grandfather there. There's evidence that they first were aware of each other in 1903, um, so before her PhD. And my grandfather had something happen, which was quite interesting. When he was 23 in that year of, of 1903, he came down with tuberculosis. And he was given three months to live by his doctor. And so he said to his mother, if I'm going to die, I want to go into the country and live as fully as possible before I die. And so they went way up to the north of New Hampshire and they purchased a small house that didn't have running water. His father had died already quite, quite a long time before. So it was just him and his mother. And, uh, didn't have running water, didn't have electricity, of course, and they had a garden, they were friends with farmers, and they just lived there. They had a goat and milked the goat for milk and lived there in a very nature-oriented way. 
as he began to gain strength, he climbs mountains around there, not huge mountains, but he was exercising. And gradually he got better and better. And when they returned to Boston and he went back to the doctor, healthy, the doctor couldn't believe it. And he did lose one of his lungs. He only had one lung, he lived to be 92 years old. Um, but the doctor used the example of what he had done, and it became one of the primary case studies that created that whole sanitarium system of when somebody has TB, take them up to a higher altitude and give them really clean air and good food, and maybe they'll get better. And that was the main treatment for TB, which was called consumption at that time. And so during that time when he was up there, one of his friends wrote him a letter and said, Frances Rumenier, which was her name, sends her regards and aspirations for your quick recovery. And not exactly those words, but something like that. And so that's the first time there's evidence of them knowing each other, but it wasn't until really 1910 that they became close and then they married very quickly. The first evidence of their family being aware of their relationship was in around February of 1910 and they were married in June of that year. She was teaching at Smith at that time and he at Harvard and they were going back and forth, uh, seeing each other a lot and, and then married at that time. And there's some beautiful things that they wrote to each other, um, including one thing my grandmother said, which is Arthur, that was his name, Arthur Stone Doing. Uh, Arthur, you, you must know how deeply I love you to let go of all this. And what she meant was her teaching. And so I have a book that my mother created of her letters and their letters back and forth and other people's letters to them and also about her family. And so, yes, that was my grandmother. So this, this whole discovery triggered a discovery of further back into the roots of Buddhism in America. I suddenly was like, well, where, who else was, uh, was doing this and when did it actually start? And so I, it went back as far as I can tell to the time of the transcendentalists in New England. And they were around like 1820 to probably 1860. And they grew out of the Unitarian Church and the, there was a friendship between two women, which I wasn't aware of in this group, which had these threads that really unified in the life of my grandmother. So normally when we talk about the transcendentalists, we talk about Emerson and Thoreau, and they were very important in that movement. Um, there was also Louisa May Alcott's father, uh, who's, who was an educator in that movement and others. But there were these two women that I found very interesting. And one was named Elizabeth Peabody. And she had a bookstore in Boston on West Street in Boston in her house, in her, in her home. And she was also an educator and began the first kindergartens in the United States, inspired by German kindergarten. There weren't kindergartens before that. Children didn't go to school until they were six, seven years old. And so there was no preschool or anything like that. So she began the first kindergartens, which then continued and was established as a regular thing in American education after her. But she also was really interesting because she translated the first sutra into English and it was the Lotus Sutra. 
she translated it from the French and published it in this magazine that Thoreau and Emerson edited. Actually, first it was Margaret Fuller who edited it, and I'm going to talk about her in a minute. So, so Elizabeth Peabody, a woman, was the translator uh, of the first sutra translated into English in the United States, in Boston. And she also was a transcendentalist. Very interesting. If you want to look her up, um, I suggest you do. So, so she, it was her, and then her friend was named Margaret Fuller. And Margaret Fuller was a really amazing woman. She was educated first by her father and really highly educated by him. The, remember, there's no colleges for women at that time. So he educated her and then she continued reading and studying. And, and she became someone who was considered by men and women to be the most well-read person in New England at that time, Margaret Fuller. And she ended up becoming very interested in women's rights and women's education. And she was the first woman to be given access to that Harvard library that even my grandmother wasn't. So this was way before that. Uh, she passed away um, in 1850, and I believe she was born in 1820. And so she had a short life, and what happened was that she had that education. She became the editor of the Dial magazine, which was the Transcendentalists magazine. And by the way, who were the Transcendentalists? Well, they came out of the Unitarian Universalist movement, but they were more, mm, I would say, mystical, and they had a big connection with nature, and they believed that nature was the expression of the divine, of God, and that's what Thoreau and Emerson were part of, and why Thoreau did what he did. So, yeah, so, so Margaret Fuller and Elizabeth Peabody were friends. And what happened was Margaret Fuller created something called conversations that were held at the bookstore that Elizabeth Peabody had started. And these were conversations with women, just only women, about the bigger questions. Like, what am I here to do? Who am I independent? of my husband, my family, of being a mother, et cetera. And they studied in these conversations or yeah, it was really study. And it was an attempt to give women a higher education um, in these, they were just called conversations. And so they studied the arts, they studied philosophy, they studied history and so on in these conversations. And, and, she, Margaret Fuller, wrote a book called The 19th Century Woman, or The Woman of the 19th Century. And it became a seed text for feminist thought much later with Susan B. Anthony in the middle of the 1800s, who then was really uh, very active in trying to get women the vote and trying to get women higher education in the Temperance Act. The Temperance Act was to try to have women be able to divorce their husbands and get custody of their children if their husbands were alcoholics and were abusing them. Because the way the law was, the men could be total drunks, abusive, and still, if the woman divorced them, often she wouldn't get custody of her own children. He would have them. And she had no money and no power. So she, um, Susan B. Anthony worked against that. So, and this influence of Margaret Fuller went on into feminist thought. And in a way, 
those meetings were the first women's consciousness raising groups that when when I was in my early 20s were the way that feminist thought was being spread were in these women's groups, just groups of women who met maybe once a week just to talk to each other. So just talking to each other about something more meaningful than what they were sewing or, you know, their children or whatever, talking about themselves and what was happening in their lives. And so there's Elizabeth Peabody and Margaret Fuller. So Margaret Fuller is organizing these conversations at Elizabeth Peabody's bookstore. And Elizabeth Peabody is translating Buddhism. So for me, this was so interesting to think that Going back, so my, my grandmother, remember, is born in 1876. This is earlier in that same century. These two women come together, and they were editing the dial, this, uh, this magazine that was really the sort of central point for the thinking of the transcendentalists, and that sutra was published in it. And the interesting thing is this, there was a book called When the Swans Came to the Lake, about the history of American Buddhism, uh, written by Rick Field, who was a, a friend of mine who, who died quite a while ago now, 1992, where he talks about this sutra and his translation, his publication in the dial, but he says that it was Thoreau that translated it. So once again, we have this history being rewritten and women written out of it. And it wasn't, and that's been corrected now. But if you read that book, it says that. And so I want to talk a little bit more about Thoreau and Emerson because they're they're really interesting. And um, to um, get an idea about what they were thinking and 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 how Buddhist. Um, she she was. Um, we don't know how Buddhist my grandmother was, but she was certainly exposed to it. And so, yeah, I've written a whole chapter about about um, my grandmother. But um, it's really the um, the row that I got really interested in because. He really was meditating and he went into uh, the forest essentially, built this cabin, I think it was 10 by 17, 10 by 15 feet. Um, and uh, Emerson was his patron. And what Thoreau wanted to do was to get away from people and basically meditate. And there's evidence in his writing that he really was meditating. I didn't, I didn't realize this until probably about 2014, I was in Boston uh, visiting a friend and we walked around Walden Pond where he lived and wrote. And he, um, he had the Dharmapada there in his retreat cabin because they were selling it in the bookstore there. They have a little gift store on the on the highway uh, near Walden Pond that's about Thoreau and everything. And they had the Dharmapada, which is sort of the key base root Buddhist text. And I said, why do you have this book? And, and she said it was in Thoreau's cabin. And so we have it. And so he would go and he would sit, being integrating with nature, holding his mind in the present moment and being. And he said sometimes he would pass the whole morning like that and not realize that he had been sitting there in his doorway until the, until the sun came in from the Western window of his house. And then he realized how long he'd been there. And so really it was Thoreau who 
was inspired by the Bhagavad Gita, the, the core Hindu text and the Dharmapada and other writings to go and to live like a yogi. And he actually called himself a yogi. And so maybe next time I will talk more about Thoreau and read some of quotes from his meditations and, uh, and talk more about what actually happened there in New England. But isn't that interesting that there is a whole root of American Buddhism in, in Boston? And I haven't included all the other roots around the United States of Buddhism uh, in New York and so on, because I was actually tracking this family connection to it in my research, but there was. Uh, and, and, and a lot of connection through Japan, also in Boston, which maybe I'll talk about as well. And the Japanese aesthetic. And so for now, I think that's, I'll leave you with that. Um, oh, great. Putting up some books. Yes. Um, the first American yogi. He actually called himself that and others called him that. So what, what the impact this has had on me is to realize, oh, I actually have a family lineage of Buddhism, not just um, Tibetan. I've always had this feeling like, why was I born there? And when I have this such a karmic link with Tibet, and then I realized in doing this research, I couldn't have been born in a better situation in the United States, and it would have been better to be born in the United States because of what happened in Tibet right after and really at the time of my birth with the Chinese invasion. So I was actually born into an American Buddhist lineage to some extent anyway, and had that exposure at a young age. And I'll also connect some of the quotes of Thoreau with my early meditation experiences. So I hope you've enjoyed this little, I haven't shared this until now, except with a few uh, of our Sangha here and, and others that I've talked to while I've been doing the research, but I haven't spoken about this publicly. And uh, so let, let us know if this interests you and um, I'll talk more about it next week. So I think it's time for us to close our meeting and sending you all lots of love for Father's Day and appreciation for all those fathers out there or those who are acting as fathers for others, caretaking them. Um, and also have a wonderful solstice celebration this Tuesday, the longest, the longest day, at least in our hemisphere. So, yeah, lots of love to you all. And let's send love out to each other. And I feel that. Thank you. And to all beings everywhere, and dedicate any merit that we have accumulated today together to the benefit of all beings. Thanks, everybody. Lots of love and see you next week, next Sunday. Uh, thank you so, so much, Lamala. I mean, this is just so wow. And um, I'm actually having all of, all of these uh, books here behind me. And, you know, all these connections are just, wow, I had shivers. And I think we, we all did. So we, we can't wait for the next uh, sharing and uh, to have your new book in our hands already. Also, thank, thank you so much for, for our uh, beautiful uh, meditation for fathers. Uh, today and we're just so lucky to be your students 
and to be able to be with you this way live. If we think about it, it's just unreal. Thank you so much, Lamala. Thank you. Thank you, Trimela. Thank you. Dear community, um, thank you so much for showing up and let's always appreciate these moments and never take our time together for granted. So at this point, uh, I want to remind you that there is an opportunity to offer Dana to Lama Sultri Maliona. You can find already the link uh, in the chat. And for those of you who are not familiar, Dana is a Pali word meaning generosity. And the practice of generosity is an integral part of the Buddhist path. So um, please offer as much as you comfortably can, which ensures the flourishing of Dharma for generations to come. Thank you, thank you so much. And until next time, may we meet again and again on the path and may all beings benefit everywhere. Thank you. Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re.